Hello and welcome to the 8th Annual ED Games Expo, a showcase of game-changing innovations in education technology developed through programs across the government. Please make sure to check the website for more information on more than 160 learning games and technologies that are available for educators and students to try out during the month of June and for the lineup of events across the week. Thank you for joining today's ED Games Expo event on Naval STEM. Be sure to stick around for the full video to see STEM initiatives in action like Sea Perch at the Naval Surface Warfare Center Philadelphia Division, underwater autonomous robotics competitions hosted by RoboNation, human-powered submarine races at the Naval Surface Warfare Center Carterock Division, the fleet video game from American Society of Naval Engineers, and Naval STEM's latest competition to design the future Navy. The STEM initiatives from the Office of Naval Research ensure the future naval workforce can meet the challenges of tomorrow. The approach centers on STEM experiences involving problem-based learning, direct exposure to internships and career paths. The dozens of naval organizations that carry on these STEM initiatives span coast to coast. ONR organizes this STEM engagement into six types of experiences. Engage, educate, attract and employ, develop and retain, collaborate and inspire. These experiences span the entire K to workforce educational continuum. The levels of engagement deepen at each grade band to ensure students and employees are inspired and possess the tools to solve the problems of the future. A couple weeks ago, the Naval Academy held its traditional problem-based learning activity the Herndon Monument Climb. The plebes banded together, often with people they met that day. They created physical tools and lasting friendships. Together they did the impossible and gained the learned experiences that they can surmount any obstacle with the tenacity, ingenuity, and cooperation expected in a naval engineer. And of course, they enjoyed the sweet smell of success. Our four organizations work together with the same theory of action. NSWC Philadelphia spearheads local STEM competitions and directly engages area youth with career panels and internships. RoboNation organizes a series of competitions across the country that inspire students in ever-increasing challenges that support the development of thousands of technology and engineering leaders across the country and the world. NSWC Carterock hosts some of these challenges and work directly with youth across the DMV with engaging projects and experiences. The American Society of Naval Engineers has been promoting the next generation of engineers since 1888, and that work continues today with learning activities, a free engineering video game, collegiate design competitions, and a focus on gender-inclusive workplaces. Together, this naval STEM work exemplifies and powers the vision and strategy of the Office of Naval Research. This video will give a brief insight into the work of our four organizations, and we encourage you to reach out if we can support your STEM community. We will start this adventure at the Philly Naval Yard. Hey guys, I'm uh, Phil Greiner, and I work at Naval Surface Warfare Center Philadelphia Division in code 326 as a mechanical engineer. What I enjoy about my job is that there's a, a big hands-on aspect to it. Um, I really get to uh, complete a lot of projects using the machines that I work on, using the 3D printers, using the 3D scanners, and then uh, taking that product all the way through uh, from a drawing through CAD design and then actually manufacturing the part. As the branch manager at NSWCPD, I work with a team of engineers uh, to make sure that they have the resources they need to support the fleet. So everything from um, making sure that they're being paid correctly, uh, that they are able to telework. Um, it's also my job to set expectations and hold our team accountable. So right now, I currently help to run the iOS reference desk. So essentially, the iOS reference desk is a help desk service, which someone can put in a request 
um, whether that is just general inquiries on logistics products, they need copies of those documents, um, or anything between those. We do drawings, tech manuals, maintenance requirement cards, MIPS. Um, but since you put in a request, we do our best to help you out. Because of strategic planning and investments, I tend to work on a lot of futuristic things, areas that we want to be involved in, um, areas that we're trying to grow, and so therefore my job stays interesting. I'm a system engineering process analyst focused on digitizing business solutions in support of the system engineering process. So each day I'm focused on looking at different ways that we can digitize the business. Especially in a world today where we're all separated and quarantined, it's more critical now than ever to think of new ways to operate so that we can collaborate more effectively while still being separated. I've been working at NSWCPD for over 10 years. I started as a chemist in the corrosion and coatings branch. I love my job. Uh, I find it incredibly fulfilling uh, with a real purpose where I, I feel like I'm making an impact in the world. <laughs> I'm Captain Alex DeRosh, Commanding Officer, Naval Surface Warfare Center, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Greater Philadelphia Sea Perch Challenge. The United States Navy is the number one Navy in the world. Part of the reason is superior equipment and weapon systems. These weapon systems were designed by scientists, engineers, and technicians who started out learning science in elementary and junior high school just like you. The scientists and engineers build many different types of systems for the Navy, including unmanned vehicles for special missions. One particular type of unmanned vehicle is a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. In the real world, when the Navy wants a new type of system, like an ROV, we specify our needs, contractors design and build a system, and the Navy selects the best one. It's very similar to what you'll be doing in the Sea Perch Challenge. You'll build your ROV, you'll learn how to operate it, and you'll compete to see who does the best job. I have two assistants standing by who are anxious to give you all the details. Hi, I'm Anthony. And I'm Amanda, and we're your official Sea Perch Guide. It's gonna be great. You guys get to design and build an ROV. And just like the captain said, an ROV is... A remotely operated vehicle. And for Sea Perch, it's an underwater robot. Which means you'll be connected to your vehicle with the cable. Right, no runaway perches. Navy engineers actually use ROVs a lot. Any idea what they're used for? Of course. The Navy uses ROVs for any one of the three Ds. Anything dull, dirty, or dangerous. In other words, Navy engineers use ROVs for tasks that are either too dangerous or can't practically be done by humans. Actually, there are ROVs all around you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ever play with a remote-controlled car? Yes, actually I had this really cool remote control car one time. It had a snake head that popped up and it sprayed water and it drove around the house really, really fast with all these little, uh, uh, never mind. A remote controlled car is a type of ROV. You control it with a remote and it does what you tell it to. It's simple, but it's the same concept. That makes sense. I mean, the military does use ROVs on a daily basis, so it would only be natural that you would see some in everyday life. But for Sea Perch, you guys will be building a very specific ROV. All right, everybody, in the pool, let's go. Uh, Anthony, I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, but Sea Perch does focus specifically on remotely controlled underwater vehicles. Each team will build and design an underwater ROV. Let's check it out. the next four months, each of you will have your own role as you design and build your own ROV. You're in store for a fun and exciting adventure. On behalf of the United States Navy, I welcome you aboard. Good luck, and I hope to see your ROV in April.
the, the Naval Surface Warfare Center Philadelphia Division does a lot of different types of undersea um, and terrestrial robotics programs uh, through FIRST Robotics and things like that. But the uh, programs at Sea Perch and at RoboNation go from Sea Perch to Sea Glide to RoboBoat, RoboSub um, at the collegiate level. So, you know, this last year we had students uh, participating in a virtual program because of the pandemic. Uh, those students participated by physically constructing a sea perch in some instances, uh, but where they weren't able to meet, they were able to virtually construct a sea perch using computer-aided design, um, utilizing Tinkercad as, as, a, as a model. Uh, that kind of morphed into our high school programs too, uh, where we had them doing more of a bug hunt exercise. Um, also in Tinkercad, where we had simulated Arduino components, uh, where students could access uh, the simulated uh, Arduino and try to pick apart both the errors in the code, in the Arduino code, as well as the circuitry in the Arduino as well. Uh, we also had students working uh, physically on, on Arduinos that were shipped to them uh, so that they could do that, that um, uh, virtually uh, as well. But we also, that's also just a component of our Sea Glide competition uh, from year to year where we have, uh, and we're going to be doing the bug hunt in the future too. Uh, but the circuitry encoding, uh, we, we enrolled last year. Uh, we also uh, encourage students to kind of think outside the box and start designing beyond the baseline. Uh, so, you know, we're given a baseline design of a sea glide uh, vessel, uh, and then students are asked to uh, go kind of above and beyond that. What's the next step uh, they can do to design uh, and expand upon that platform. So this year we challenged students to design this external sensor part pod um, that they did uh, virtually uh, and then provided that to the judges. Um, moving into kind of our collegiate programs, we're just starting to uh, get kicked off into um, both RoboBoat, which is a surface uh, vehicle, uh, and RoboSub, which is an underwater vehicle, but we have uh, teams from various universities uh, actually stretching all the way down to Puerto Rico, uh, but uh, also within uh, the local uh, Philadelphia area where we're stationed, uh, who are uh, involved in these efforts. Um, and then all of that kind of links into our internship program. So we have the Science and Engineering Apprenticeship Program, uh, or SEAP, uh, and then the Naval Research Enterprise Internship Program, uh, or NREP. The SEAP program is uh, high school students. The NREP program is, is college students. So there really is kind of this pipeline of programs that you can kind of get your get a feel for uh, marine engineering, for naval architecture, uh, for um, even electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, how they all kind of tie together into a systems engineering kind of setting, uh, which ties directly into what we do, which is supporting machinery systems uh, for ships. So um, all of that kind of ties together and prepares students uh, in a way that they can then take these lessons learned from these programs like Sea Perch and Sea Glide and RoboBoat and RoboSub and apply them directly uh, into a working environment uh, supporting the fleet. There was a, a senior design project, I would say, was probably my favorite course. Um, obviously, there's a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of creativity um, when it comes to your senior design project. Um, the course, obviously, they kind of just want uh, to make sure you're meeting different milestones for your, your year long project. Um, you know, are you meeting with your team? Are you meeting with sponsors? What are some of the roadblocks you're having? Um, but my senior design project essentially um, allowed those that were hard of hearing to be able to go to a play or go to any live type of performance and um, kind of uh, read, be able to read what's being said um, on the stage. And some uh, places offer, you know, glasses like that, but in different settings, um, they weren't always available. So uh, a patron could have their own glasses and just upload the software and, and have it read there. So that's definitely something where you can see the real world impact um, to what you're working on. Um, some classes, you know, I don't want to say it, but the information just goes in one ear and out the other because you can't, you don't know how to apply it, you know? Uh, so being able to apply what you're learning in school, the theories you're learning, um, and, and apply it to how it can help those. I think that was a great 
class. And I really enjoyed the way the instructor moderated it and helped us along through our project. Right. How about you? What's an undervalued skill in the STEM that people typically don't don't associate with the, the science, the engineering, the, the the math education? Yeah, so I'll say for me, I'd probably say communication. Um, kind of story. So probably my probably about two years in, I took a rotation with the Advanced Public Development uh, Program. I worked with Sean Brennan, ironically. Uh, my job there was uh, I was the risk manager. Um, and for people that don't know what risks are, um, essentially kind of think of it as bad news. But the idea is that, um, you know, if we identify it early enough, it won't be bad news. Um, so my job all day was basically to talk to people, talk to them about their problems. What, what are you worried about? Almost like a psychologist. Um, but they're like technical problems and things that may be a problem for the fleet in the future, but not necessarily now. Um, so in that role, I really had to learn how to communicate. I had to take something so complex, break it down for um, either our sponsors, our program managers that were briefing um, the TD and the captain, and break all the information down um, so they can get a very clear idea of what the issue is um, without knowing all the nitty gritty details. Perch is RoboNation's cornerstone program, and it's our entry point for many of our students. It's a great starting point no matter what age. Not just a competition, but it's something that they can take and use out in the real world. Everything they're learning through the Sea Perch program are meant to be life lessons that they apply on a much larger scale as they continue to mature and grow. We have teams competing from around the world today, and 90 different regional competitions are represented here. After reading about on the Sea Perch website, I realized how amazing this opportunity would be. Seeing the other team from our school and all the teams made me want to join this program. I guess you'd say the challenge of it is what brings you know us back. It just helps you grow. We have never dealt with robotics at all. Ever. In our yes. lives. We had to actually use the manuals to build everything step by step. I think it's pretty good that people from all around the world are able to come and do this because it's a great program and I hope that everyone's able to experience it. You just want them to succeed to the best that they can and when they do, you're proud. It gives them an aspect of STEM related education that they may or may not necessarily get during a regular academic curriculum. They're actually trying to get people from the community, like, into a workspace. We have developed a pretty cool hands-on engineering project called Underwater Sea Glider. Students learn to program an Arduino microcontroller to control the buoyancy engine of an autonomous glider. Uh, I based it off of an airplane, um, and it works pretty well. I haven't had too many malfunctions with it. Yesterday I had a little bit of a problem trying to get the circuit board to work, but we fixed that, and so everything's working really good. The focus here has been to bring students from all over Alaska to a residential setting where they can be completely focused on building these gliders, troubleshooting the gliders, working with each other, developing teamwork skills, um, developing collaboration skills, all the things that um, engineers need to do their job and to have fun while doing it. Yeah, I'm just into robotics and melting stuff, I guess. So that's the servo spinning the screw that's moving it up. The white thing is a 3D printed part that we filled with little lead beads, BB things. When the weight moves to the front, it's filled up with water in the back, and it makes our glider move downwards. So this would be making it dive forward. It's a quarter of nine, I think, p.m., and we're in the lab because kids want us to be in the lab. <laughs> uh, 
Can't complain about that. They started in the lab before 9 a.m. this morning when they came down early, so it's been a long day. <laughs> I had to get this finished, and I didn't really want to go up to dinner at all because I knew I had to get this done. Once you're on a project, you're just like basically addicted, and you can't, you can't stop until it's done. It's about exposure. It's about making what often people think is is only reserved for the very, very bright or the very, very smart or the very, very gifted. It's about making it accessible. They may not have a scientist or engineer as a mom or dad, and so they may never have thought that that's something that they'd be good at, that that's a field that they would be, would be able to make a contribution in. Um, I actually have had zero experience with soldering. I actually just started when I came here. Uh, a couple days ago. This project is funded by the National Defense Education Program. The mission of that program is to be able to partner DOD STEM professionals, scientists and engineers at DOD labs with local schools to bring more content relevant engineering into the classroom and to build partnerships with teachers and students. Yeah, I'm really impressed with what we've done. I did not think it would come out the way it did, but um, then again, you can't really go with your original idea and stick with it. You've got to make changes with it as you go, and I think that's really an important thing to understand when you're engineering is you always have to, you know, test, experiment, then fix something, test, experiment, fix another thing until you finally get what you want out of whatever you're trying to invent. We had many parts that failed the first time and we had to replace, take apart, Rewire. Oh, come on. Why now? Oh, there we go. One of the great things to see is that each kid has had something not work over the course of the week, and they don't run to the teacher to ask them how to fix it. They'll go back on their own five to ten times to figure out how to solve their own problems. This is an MCPS moment. Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring is the scene of an exciting new high-tech project. Engineering students, in collaboration with the United States Navy, are getting hands-on experience building underwater drones called sea gliders. The students, using Navy plans and Navy parts, will assemble 24 scale models of underwater robots that are actually in use by the Navy. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are a huge part of our project-based learning. Students will use skills from each of those disciplines in order to make their project better. John Kaluta, who teaches principles of engineering at Montgomery Blair High School, believes the collaboration with the Navy engineers is a great way to bring an authentic engineering experience to the students in his classroom. I'm holding one of the sea glider submarine bodies where the students will design uh, the wing shape and they'll put some internal components inside that my students are building to control what's called the pitch uh, and the ballast. Uh, it's a, sort of a real live math problem. Mechanical engineer Michael Britt Crane is the coordinator of the Navy Sea Glide Educational Initiative. There's no propulsor. It uses just buoyancy and changes in pitch and then lift on the wings to propel it going forward. It's the first learning opportunity to, to really see this novel method of propulsion and understand how it works. Kids really connect with that. The Sea Glider project is experiential learning and an example of how community partnerships work to increase engagement for MCPS students. This is a model, but it's true to life. They know that there's a real one in, in existence, a larger version. So that when they make a tabletop model that has the similar control, computer control, uh, they can see, they can make the connection to the real world. RoboBoat is one of many competitions that are done throughout the year to bring together students that can develop autonomous systems to compete and come up with solutions on the fly. My favorite thing about RoboBoat was watching the different teams from so many different parts of the world come together for a robotics competition. It really tells you that our country, I guess, is going in the right direction of STEM and the importance of robotics in our future. These kids have total freedom to you know, go out, uh, try things, fail things riding on the line. They're able to just go out and do what they you know, think might work and if it doesn't, try again. Sure, it's a competition, but each team is open up to the other. You become confident that you at least can make a contribution to its progress. Some come from universities, some from high schools with varying levels of experiences and years competing. So it has a big open source community and everyone's been super friendly, super helpful, and it's, it's generally an awesome community. 
we get to work with things that we may not be working if we were just studying or if we were just concentrating on exams. So to getting to have this experience beforehand, it helps us either get a career at a company or start a company of our own. This experience definitely helps you. It's a good place for networking, so you meet people from other universities, you meet the sponsors, and it helps you develop that networking that you need when you become a professional, also that you're putting all of that technical skills that you study within the university into practice. I think that it's just so different from anything else that I've done that I think it's a really amazing opportunity, especially to get into as a freshman and then hopefully continue it when I go to university and when I go to college. Um, they learn new skills that they might not have undertaken and they learn how to work as a team, developing those skills in particular areas. I find it very inspiring, their ability to come back year after year. They do the technical paper, they do presentations, interview questions, besides the technical aspect of the boat itself. Learning how to do power, learning how to work with a team, learning how to work within a deadline, every part of this competition applies to some sort of real world challenge. Innovation is a big part of RoboSub, and teams are always developing new approaches and designs to get a competitive edge. But it isn't just the pressure of the competition that drives innovation. Sometimes limits on resources like money and high-tech equipment force teams to innovate in order to compete on a budget. Because we don't have super unlimited resources, in the past we've cannibalized old robots and used their parts to build the new robot. This year we tried to get enough funding and enough resources so we can have two working robots and that worked out hugely in our favor because our new bot had a manufacturing malfunction. If we had taken apart the old bot, we wouldn't have a robot at all right now. We didn't have the budget to buy the T100 and T200 thrusters that everyone's using. We just used bilge pumps and built a shroud and painted them. So one thing we did have a lot of access to was 3D printers. So we 3D printed things from the brackets to the props and our sensor housings. Anything we could, we CAD and 3D printed. We try to buy components off the shelf when we can, like these boxes that we're using for the batteries. We actually bought them at Walmart, and all we had to do was drill holes in them to pass wires through for the power. And that was really easy, and they're great and waterproof and quick to get into. Software is critical to an autonomy competition like RoboSub. While machine learning approaches are making some aspects of software design easier, they still require extensive data collection, which requires another resource that can be in short supply, time. Neural network training, we found that we need at least 2,000 photos of the part that we want to identify. So we found on the RoboSub forum an old model of this whole transdeck pool. We prepared models of all the stuff that is in those tasks. We tried to make it as realistic as possible watching videos so that when we come here and put our submarine in the water, we see similar conditions as in our environment. At RoboSub, Murphy's Law is ever-present. Things get lost, broken, or just don't work the way they did back in the lab. With everyone working against the same challenges, the students put emphasis on creating a collaborative environment where everyone feels welcome to ask for help or borrow critical pieces of equipment when needed. RoboSub is an autonomous vehicle competition, but the teams themselves behave far from autonomously. The interactions between teams at the competition are more reminiscent of an international academic conference than a setting in which they are pitted against one another. The international component is especially important because while engineering may be a universal language, different approaches and ideas from around the world means that teams always have a lot to learn from those originating from far away. It's cool to see that there's so many people from other countries. We've talked to some of them, so it's been nice to hear how they've done it. And there is kind of an appeal to that. It's so easy to get stuck in your little bubble, right? Like our club room's about the size of the tent that we have behind us. Then you come down here, and it's cool to see how everyone does the same thing, but we all interpret it in different ways. It's long been said that teams at RoboSub aren't really competing against each other. They're competing together against technical director Dave Novick and the unsolved technological challenges of marine autonomy that this course represents. We're incredibly proud of every student's enthusiasm to create a community of robotics enthusiasts. And we're very excited to see it continue and grow and push the limits of underwater autonomy. One thing we do have is a community, both at home with Beaver, that's very supportive. And at the same time, we're also able to collaborate with a lot of people here. 
I started off in middle school. We originally were with the Sea Perch competition, but we moved on to the Robo Sub competition, deciding that we wanted to do something autonomous. And when we started, we didn't have a lot of money to work with. We were usually buying Arduinos and small blackbone boards at the time. And we just stuck with going every year and working and improving on everything. And just sticking with that has brought me to have a really good relationship with Embry-Riddle. And so now I'm going to go to college there with them and also continue to keep working on all of the competitions. Eighty-five students from Carter Rock Elementary participated in the annual Seaplane Challenge held at the Naval Surface Warfare Center Carter Rock Division on February 25th. We used the, the design of the NC flying boats and the flight of the, of the NC-4 as an exciting story to build from. Uh, there's adventure, there's history, uh, and, and then there's this wonderful engineering story about how the aircraft was designed and built and the achievements that went into making this happen. And we use that as a way to excite the students about building their own small version of this aircraft and then flying it in, in some way trying to recreate that excitement. Students work in teams to build a model glider based on the original Navy NC-4 seaplane design and Navy engineers mentor the teams as their designs progress. And those kids are the most open to new ideas. They are the ones that if they see something and they really love it, they're going to take it in and pursue it. So we saw an opportunity to uh, build a program designed for elementary school kids that could get them excited, they could have a lot of fun, and hopefully some of them will decide that this is something that they want to pursue and, and continue on with through, through schooling and, and beyond. The challenge is sponsored by the Office of Naval Research and highlights the scientific principles of aviation, aerodynamics, and hydrodynamics and teaches students to keep an open mind to different design approaches and to look at failures as opportunities for learning and improvement. Okay, can you go back and reread it? Can you, can you add a little bit more? And they're really reluctant to do that. So I think exposing them to challenges like this, which force them to be persistent and stick with something for a longer period of time, is really meaningful for them. The week-long event concludes with a tour of the Warfare Center and a flight competition. So did you have fun doing the seaplane challenge? Yes. What was your favorite part? Probably, um, like, designing it. Like, I really liked adding the, the um, I like really adding the details about it. Hello, I'm Jack Pactol, and I work for the Center for Innovation and Ship Design, otherwise known as CISD, as a ship design concept engineer here at Naval Surface Warfare Center, Carter Rock Division. The CAP program, Carter Rock's been engaged with it for about 10 years now, and there are 25 uh, Department of Navy labs that actually do participate with the CAP program. Um, they are comprised of high school students, and it is a paid internship for the eight weeks that they are on board conducting uh, science activities or engineering activities. And it's just to help foster the, the high schoolers into a science and engineering field or give them exposure to what they could possibly do in the future. 
So uh, this summer, uh, Carter Rock had 26 to 28 SEAP interns come on board. And when they get here, they're divided between uh, one, one mentor to one intern, all the way up to, I think our new largest group this summer was nine interns to one mentor. And they will be given a main project for the eight weeks that they're here, either a science project to experiment a particular lab or a design project that they'll go through the design steps to accomplish a final project within a particular field of the mentor that they're working with. And they also worked on the sea perch to give them experience with ROVs and modified it into a WAMV model and were able to change the propulsion and look at how changing the propulsion can change the mobility as well as the station keeping. And then at the end of their mentorship, they'll actually go in and they'll do a final presentation in the MTIC or our main auditorium in front of other experts within Carter Rock that can sit there and openly ask them questions and see if they actually did understand the science behind what they were working with for the summer. So the SEAP program overall allows them to come in and work within a science or engineering field, gain confidence and exposure to a variety of different science and engineering fields on Carter Rock or that Carter Rock can provide for them to work in. And hopefully it'll foster an excitement in them where they'll study that within their college time, come back as a, as a college intern and work further in-depth studies within that area and then even come back later and possibly be employed either here at Carter Rock or within the Department of Defense somewhere working as a science or engineer. My name is Jeanette Nicewinter and I am the new race controller for the International Submarine Races and what that means is that I am the person who lines up the submarines in a queue, tells them when to put their people inside of the sub, and then tells them when to start down the race course. And then I am the voice on the PA system that tells everybody what's going on on the race course and when subs are stopped or if they complete their runs. That's also my job as well to kind of be that front face to the public as well through that PA system. I am involved with the International Submarine Races because of my passion for education. As a college professor myself, I know how you can really influence students' lives with just one action or a kind word or just a little bit of guidance that they might need. And since this is a STEM competition and this is a learning opportunity for all of these students, I'm involved to be really a resource for those students and be a resource for these future engineers and to show them what sort of possibilities they have in their career or in their lives. Yeah, we're here to show off what we've built over the last year. Uh, we brought some younger people to try and give them some more experience and we're hoping to have a good time and have some fun and really celebrate what we were able to accomplish in this last year. It's just a really great hands-on experience, a really good team building experience, and it's just like a practical uh, application of knowledge, which I think is really important um, for everybody. We're all super excited to be here. Uh, the races here are great every year. They're really organized. They go really well. We have tons of fun. Um, we're hopefully going to finish the race today. We tried a couple of tips yesterday, but ran into a few technical difficulties. So we got it fixed up, and we're ready to rock and roll. We recognize the top teams by providing speed awards in several different categories. Those categories, the boats can be one or two people. They can have a propeller or they can be propulsed by some other method. And then we provide speed awards at the high school and at the college level and finally in that independent team level. Some of the other things we recognize are and important to us are innovation. We also have another award that, again, along the lines of technology, we call it the Best Use of Technology Award. The Navy gains a great deal by the fact that we're exposing them to the world-class facilities here at Carter Rock. We're exposing those young men and women to the opportunities that they have in a facility like Carter Rock or any other technical facility the Navy supports. And, our, in, in all honesty, the support brethren that we have in the contracting world. You know, our desire is to provide a venue that enhances the, the maritime sciences and engineering so that those individuals will join in and ultimately support what this nation needs by joining the workforce in some manner. Thank <laughs> you.
Speed is one of the things they look for at these races, but it's not the only thing that's judged. We stopped to talk to one of the ISR judges this year, Jane Louie, for an insight on what the judges score. All right, I'm Jane Louie. I work at Card Rock um, as a naval architect, and uh, I am at the sub races this year as a judge. So um, in addition to uh, the in-water racing, the students come by to talk to the judges, and they, they, submit, um, they submit written reports prior to the race and then they come and do presentations throughout the week and have to explain their design and build process, um, their, their trade-offs that they took into account to decide what kind of propulsion system to use, what kind of materials um, to create their hull out of, what to make their control surfaces out of, and things like that. All these ideas are just, you know, taking some of that video game knowledge that you do have and expanding it to some more of these real world applications that require simulations. But uh, what, what ships need is they need to balance the force of the water and the force of gravity. And so one thing that you may not consider, these ships actually end up being a little too light. It's a bunch of air and a little metal container. That's kind of what these ships can be if we don't add a ballast tank. So what ballast tanks do is add water in compartments on the very bottom of the boat. Uh, but these ballast tanks are really cheap. It's just a bunch of metal boxes. The ocean water is free. So we fill in a bunch of weight. Uh, if my ship is weighing 431,000 kilograms, uh, I probably added 145,000 kilograms of water to the bottom of the boat. That way it sinks into the, into the ocean a little bit more so that can't be pushed as easily by waves. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in this simulator in a moment.
Russell. I'm with the Office of Naval Research, uh, Sea Warfare and Weapons Department. Um, we sponsored a, uh, a competition this year at the MAC conference in Baltimore called uh, PEP, Promoting Electric Propulsion. Uh, the Navy knows that uh, both for uh, indus industrial systems and, and military systems, uh, a lot of people are looking at uh, electric propulsion for, for marine craft. So we sponsored this competition to try to generate public interest uh, um, and eventually we want to include universities, engineering schools, uh, uh, senior design teams and things like that and, and grow this into a bigger competition, have not just small businesses but have academic teams come out here and compete in the harbor here in Baltimore and uh, run their electric boats uh, on an endurance course and a speed course and hopefully you know as a result of that we'll get more students interested in it. Um, we promote more research in the field and then we'll be able to grow the American technologies uh, you know, slowly uh, from that point on. So um, we had a small competition this year but we only had a couple of months to prepare for it. Um, and I think in two years when we have another MAC in 2020, uh, we'll have uh, some university teams here competing and we'll be on our way to compete with the rest of the international community that's uh, that's uh, pulling ahead of us right now in some of these technologies. So America's sort of playing catch up uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area and we're hoping to accelerate our, our, our uh, development of these technologies through competitions like this and other STEM type events. My story is fairly simple. I was also part of the first class of women to be admitted to the Naval Academy, and I was the only black woman admitted in that class. So as I thought, think about mentorship and allyship, which I think is also equally important, um, I think about just understanding the value of the individual um, and understanding the value of ourselves, that we are important, that we are where we're supposed to be, um, that we're qualified, that we're capable, and that we just need to show the resilience and demonstrate that capability and ability to accomplish whatever objectives have been set forth for us to accomplish, that that is critical to being able to, to move forward and be taken seriously in any environment. I'm there at NAPSI and somebody walks over to me and, you know, they see this lieutenant in uniform sitting there working on these engineering problems. Who are you? What's your background? He said, you ought to become an engineering duty officer. And by golly, that man just kept hands on me. I got out of the I got out of the Navy, joined the reserve. Next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call from someone who would become my qualification officer in EDO. I mean, I, I didn't even know my own phone number. We just moved into the place and my mom answered the phone and said, it's the Navy. She thought I was being called up to some war somewhere. So things have changed, but Mary Lacey was a jewel who Pat Woody was talking about. She mentored us and she made sure she knew who we were and we had to mentor other women. And she laid it on our hearts and our minds. On the individual level, what can you do to groom 
to get yourself from the entry level to the executive suite. And I think there's, I'm going to say three things for the individual and three things for the organization. The individuals need to be purpose-driven, resilient, agile learners. I think if they are purpose-driven, they're looking to be part of something bigger than themselves and they've got a sense of purpose. They're resilient because look at the COVID, look at the cybersecurity hacks. Um, You don't have time to plan anymore. I mean, we, the Navy especially is great at this, war planning and war gaming. We're going to have to be, um, you know, agile learners and resilient to these um, arrows that are coming in from every uh, point. So agile learners, purpose-driven, resilient. And the organization needs to be able to know how to accommodate the workforce to the senior executive level. What kind of a workplace environment do you provide her? ONR with their CAP program has been fantastic, right? We always had CAPs when I where I worked, and uh, that was a big proponent for me. You know, those things matter because you get these young, uh, these young children. Truthfully, right? They're young children, and you talk to them about what they can do with a STEM career, and you mm-hmm. you relay it in all the simple ways, right? Like uh, you wouldn't have this uh, you wouldn't have this iPhone without an engineer, right? Those kinds of things that they can all relate to, and and then you start weaving mm-hmm. in. In my case, I always spoke about the Navy. Um, but how great the Navy is and what it does and how it's in the Constitution and uh, the, and the great responsibility for commerce and to keep our waterways safe and our way of life. And, you know, that really resonates. It resonates with children. It resonates with, the, you know, the preteens, the teenagers. Um, so we have to keep doing all of that because it really is a national challenge. Um, I kind of want to riff off of that. Caroline said earlier is that um, at, like all of us can do outreach, just like every one of us can be a, a mentor. I think that's a challenge to everyone in the audience is to is to do your outreach um, as an engineer and say, you know, and like I'm an engineer and it's a very um, broad definition. Um, you don't even have to have majored in engineering to be an engineer. You know, you can shift careers later on in life and it's really like thinking like an engineer. Um, and it's not just, you know, like, uh, you know, pulling out your pocket protector and writing down numbers and things like that. It's that, but there's also these cool things to it also. Um, and it's and it's being part of a team. I think that's what I really didn't realize um, when I was growing up. Uh, you know, people said, do engineering because you're good at math and science. And I had no idea what engineering was. Um, and then go to the Naval Academy, there were these cool labs and there was something called an infinite beach. And I was like, I, I can deal with an infinite beach. This sounds amazing. Um, so I think if you if you help spin it that way and talk about what you do and look for those opportunities um, to kind of wear your engineering badge proudly, it'll it'll become a thing. Heidi, when you spoke earlier, um, as, as far as like seeing that next step, like those people behind you, like that just it really like um, resonated with me. And I just when I think about the future of where aviation is going and where engineering is going and where. Um, sort of we're developing in, in the space race. I just, this mentorship, this vision that that we have is so important because the people who are listening who are in college right now or in high school right now are going to be the ones that are going to be solving those problems. And we are like, I think everyone is very um, excited and like primed to help you get there because of how important what you're going to do for this nation and like for technology as a whole is with this engineering background And then for those of you in the chat who are senior and you're hearing this and you haven't considered your opportunity to mentor men and women, um, this is like your charge and your challenge to kind of take some of these notes and figure out what you can offer because you can offer something to help that next generation, to help the technology, like to help that relationship, but also help the technology grow because the people who are listening to this are going to be the ones doing it. Um, So it's like... I don't, I could do all the cool flight tests in the world and I could do this forever. But like, if I don't encourage other people to be test pilots or to be naval officers or to go to the Naval Academy and get engineering degrees, we're not going to continue to grow. So you, when you said that, Heidi, it just like resonated with me. And I just hope that those of you who are listening know that you play an important role in like the future of like this country.
Greetings. I'm Rear Admiral Lawrence Selby. I'm the chief of Naval Research. Uh, I head an organization called the Office of Naval Research, which has thousands of men and women dedicated to studying science and technology to try to determine the future technologies that will be applicable to the U.S. Navy or the United States Marine Corps. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to the Naval Horizons program. Naval Horizons is a video series we've put together with 17 different videos that show some real hard-hitting science and technology focus areas that we have in the Navy and Marine Corps. These are things like AI, autonomy, uh, ship design, ship hydrodynamics, uh, really some cutting edge things, even uh, advanced manufacturing, 3D printing. We've got scientists and engineers who will talk to you about these different topics, explain to you kind of who they are, why they got interested in the field, and what their field does, uh, and to try to explain it to you so you have a better understanding of what opportunities there might be in a STEM-related field for your future. And so I'm really interested in having you find something you're passionate about, uh, more than worrying about whether you come work directly for me or some other a Navy Marine Corps organization. If you do, that's great. I'd love to have you. But again, I, I just want to make sure you don't uh, leave anything behind on the table You know, when you're thinking about your future. Uh, don't shortchange yourself. You can probably do this stuff. It's really exciting. It'll keep you interested. Uh, yeah, it takes a little bit of work, but the stuff we do is really impactful and really, I think, really fun. Um, so as you view these videos, I want you to you have a homework assignment. I want you to think about what the future of, in my case, concerns, of course, the Navy and Marine Corps is. I want you to think about that. I, I'm talking to people about trying to reimagine what naval power is, um, not what it could be, not what it would be if you continue to build the same things today, but what if you totally had a blank sheet of paper and could start from scratch? What, what would it look like? So I want you to reimagine naval power and help me think through what your ideas would be if you were to build uh, something, if you were to design something. If you were to come up with a new way of doing business, what would it be? So that's really your homework assignment as you view these videos. But I encourage you to really kind of think totally outside of the box, really stretch your imagination and let us hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, like anything else in life, once you've done something for a long enough time, like myself, you tend to uh, get more set in your ways. And it's a constant, for myself, it's a constant uh, struggle to kind of continue to push those blinders open to stay open to different ideas. And I do that through reading, dialogue with a lot of different people, uh, through engaging a diverse crowd of individuals thinking different thoughts about problem sets. Uh, one thing that we highly value in the Navy and Marine Corps is diversity, and that's diversity when that could be gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, where you study, where you came from, the way you think, all that is highly valued. And in fact, many of our greatest breakthroughs in humanity occur because you brought somebody in with a different thought process or thought pattern that had a had an insight that, that others did not have. And it's that collaboration and that bringing together of different thoughts with different people with different backgrounds and diversity, a diverse group that really will solve our hardest, most complex problems in the future. And if you embrace this, I think you can actually turn this into uh, something that could uh, you can look back upon and realize that hey, you made a difference and really kind of helped set us on a different course that takes us to the next level uh, as, as a country, as a society, as, as the human race. I think it's, it's that important. So I encourage you to, to really stretch your imagination as you undergo this exercise. But really, thank you very much for participating. I'm really excited to see what, uh, what you provide us. Thank you. <laughs>